Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Science Says. You, you may have noticed um, that our, on our opening slides, they show our new logo uh, for the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, the organization that resulted from the integration of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center earlier this year. And we're incredibly excited to serve as UW Medicine's cancer program. It's really exciting to see all of this come to life. And, you know, the merger is about more than a new logo and a name. Uh, of course. It's about bringing together comprehensive care and advanced research to provide the very latest treatment options and to accelerate discoveries for our patients. It's about giving our researchers the tools they need to more efficiently apply what they learn from the trials to fuel further advances. And But if you put these things together, they build the foundation for what we want to accomplish in oncology. Well, I guess I would be burying the lead if I did not acknowledge what an incredible day today is for the Fred Hutch. A few hours ago, we announced that we've received a landmark commitment from the Bezos family, $710.5 million over the next decade to increase the pace and breadth of medical breakthroughs in cancer and infectious diseases. On behalf of all of the scientists at the Fred Hutch, all of the patients at the Fred Hutch and all of the cancer patients at Fred Hutch and UW Medicine, I want to express our deepest thanks and, and recognition and, and uh, gratitude to the Bezos family, particularly to Mike and to Jackie Bezos uh, for their vision um, in, in supporting what goes on at the Fred Hutch. This gift will enable our investigators and clinicians to tackle questions uh, from many different angles simultaneously. So progress in one area can inform, advance, and accelerate discoveries across the cancer uh, uh, spectrum and continuum, and uh, also COVID and infectious diseases. Those of you who participate in our science says, know that we've done a lot on COVID and infectious diseases uh, at the Fred Hutch as well. You can learn more about this gift and its potential impact at the Fred Hutch at fredhutch.org, and Guppy has placed a link in the Q&A for you to be able to look at and see there. And we'll be sharing more about what this gift does. We just announced it um, about an hour and a half ago. Um, so we'll be learning more about it in the coming weeks, months, and years. Now the Bezos family's gift comes just a month after another extraordinary gift from Stuart and Molly Sloan to support precision oncology. And that's the topic of today's uh, discussion that we're gonna talk about uh, with our panels. These two gifts and the generous people behind them share a passionate belief in the power of science to save lives. And they're part of a vast and vibrant community of supporters, and so are you. And, and that's why you're here, is because you're interested in what's happening at the Fred Hutch. You're interested in the science that drives our understanding of cancer as we move forward. Everyone has something unique and meaningful to contribute toward cures, and we're grateful for every gift we get at the Fred Hutch, whether it's $70 or $700 million. Now, I'm delighted to turn our attention to an area of research that's poised to transform care, which is precision oncology. And I wanna thank everyone for coming here today. Talk about precision oncology. We have a really terrific uh, panel. I've talked about precision oncology in the past, and you know the way I think of precision oncology, it's matching the molecular characteristics of the cancer, with the molecular characteristics of the patient's microbiome and their immune system, with the characteristics of the potential treatments that can possibly attack and, and, and cause that cancer to regress. And it might be different for Mrs. Johnson than it is for Mrs. Jones. And so that's very important that we look at how um, cancers affect individuals and how the individual response to cancer can differ from person to person. Recently, Stuart and Molly Sloan gave us a $78 million gift, which was the largest gift in the history of the Fred Hutch to supercharge this endeavor. And what this will do, it allow us to launch the Stuart and Molly Sloan Precision Oncology Institute, where our researchers will work to personalize treatments to each person living with cancer and to revolutionize risk reduction strategies. This will allow us to recruit a new leader in precision oncology to the Fred Hutch, and it will help us in developing a 400,000 square foot building 
in which to house this institute and bring more laboratory scientists who will be the future of science here at the Fred Hutch. And together with the Bezos gift, the Sloan gift, will set the Hutch on a terrific road for being able to accomplish uh, new things in cancer and bring us closer um, to being able to cure cancer. One of my feelings is that when one looks at the ecosystem of care for cancer, we've got terrific cancer hospitals. We've got wonderful pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies that are great at developing products. But the hole in cancer research, the, the biggest need in my mind is we need ideas. We need those fundamental discoveries that will change the way we see cancer and change the way we approach it and treat it. And that comes mostly from places like the Hutch, cancer centers and hospitals around the country that are doing important cancer research. So as we look forward to the impact that the Sloan gift will, uh, will make, we want to dive a little bit deeper today into precision oncology. We'll talk about sequencing tumor genomes. Uh, we'll talk about what does that mean in terms of data needs? How do we handle the data that's associated with precision oncology? And then we'll finish by hearing an example of how we can put all of this together in treating cancers as we move forward. So I'd like to start off by introducing Dr. Chris Bake. Um, Chris is a medical oncologist and a researcher at the Fred Hutch and UW Medicine. She's an associate professor at UW Medicine and also associate professor in the clinical research department division here at the Fred Hutch. She is an expert in lung cancer and she's known for developing targeted therapies for people with lung cancer and people with head and neck cancers. She's also working to understand the mechanisms of primary and secondary resistance to immunotherapy, uh, which basically means why immunotherapy doesn't work for everyone. Um, and and uh, she's done terrific work in this area. Chris, welcome. Thank you so much um, for coming here. So I guess I'd like to start off by asking you a question. Um, and you know, we, we talk about um, precision oncology and I gave you a, a I gave an understanding of what, how I think of precision oncology, but we all see it a little bit differently. Chris, how do you think of precision oncology? How would you define precision oncology? Yeah, thanks for having me, Tom, and thank you everyone for being here and a special uh, hi to some of my patients who are joining us today. Um, you know, when I think of precision oncology, I think of, you know, just finding or coming up with the right treatment for the patient in front of me, whether by understanding the cancer, but also understanding how the body um, sort of deals with the treatments, you know, metabolizes the treatments and their personal and medical history where they are. So all those things will help us to hone down on the specific treatment. And that's really how I think of precision oncology. You know, we do some of that in lung cancer. You know, I wear several hats, uh, but I think of myself first and foremost, a lung cancer doctor and precision oncology is at the you know, heart of that. Um, you know, in clinic, when I first meet a patient with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, I'm thinking of, you know, 15 different treatments that I can choose from. And my job is to find the right treatment for the patient in front of me. And, you know, that usually starts by really making sure that we have good genetic testing of their tumor so that we understand the genetic makeup of their cancer. So I would, you know, take into account the results of that information, but it doesn't stop there. You know, I'm looking at their medical history, where they are, and come up with an individualized treatment plan for the patient in front of me for non with non-small cell lung cancer that will be very different from the second patient with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, so that's how I think of procedural oncology. And, and I guess one of the questions, Chris, when, when you see a new patient, Let's say you, you were to see a new patient with, with advanced lung cancer uh, this week. Um, what would you send to profile that cancer? Would, would you send their blood? Would you send their tumor? And what would you send it for? What information do you want back mm -hmm. regarding the patient's cancer? Yeah, so first would be to send their tumor. You know, usually it comes uh, from a biopsy for genetic testing. And um, we aim to do what we call broad genetic testing, uh, which is to look for many different genes at the same time. Um, and we often do uh, with a platform, a uh, type of test called Oncoplex, which uh, Dr. Preacher will talk about later on, I'm, I'm sure. Um, but there are other you know, tests, but that really is a key information 
There's some, you know, other tests that we will use. Uh, we can sometimes detect that in blood, um, and but blood is imperfect sometimes. So it's a, you know, it's a complementary type of uh, information. So both tissue and blood would be helpful in in the genetic. So Chris, how often do you send blood for for sequencing as opposed to just I, you you pretty much always send tumor when you can, but how often do you also send blood? So blood um, in the beginning, especially if the tissue is going to take too long um, to get the results. A lot of times the blood can take five business days for us to get the results and can give us uh, good information. Um, at the time when the when treatment stop working, I do also test their blood uh, at times. Uh, it, there's some caveats because sometimes that doesn't yield in useful information. So it's not something I do all, all the time, but that is a tool that we can use. And Chris, is when you send the blood, is that the same thing as a liquid biopsy? Right, right. So that's another term for liquid biopsy, a blood uh, genetic test. And terrific. And so, Chris, one of the things that I've heard from patients, uh, which I think is really interesting, is patients have said, well, you know, Dr. Lynch, my worry is that that information is very personal to me, that that's my private genetic information, uh, which which people can use to identify me. How do you discuss that with patients and how do you talk to them about confidentiality and what, what that means to have genetic testing done? And do you get those questions asked from patients? I do, but I actually not as often as, as I would have uh, thought. So first thing is that I would say the vast majority of patients are open to sharing their information if, um, you know, if it's going to help another generation of patients. So I've been very impressed by the generosity of patients. So that's the first thing. But I, certainly there are concerns about confidentiality. Um, so we, you know, really ensure that whenever there's data sharing amongst the researchers, that these are de-identified information, um, so that you know only the salient information for research is shared among people that don't know them. But you know, we don't include any of their identifiers. So you know, I, I try to reassure them that we are doing our utmost uh, best to keep their you know confidentiality um, protected. So. Let's say you do a, you send an Oncoplex test off, and the Oncoplex comes back and says that the patient has an EGFR mutation. How does that change what you offer as a medical oncologist? Yeah, so, you know, there are a number of different treatments that we can offer, and usually if an EGFR comes back, then we would give a targeted therapy directed at EGFR. So that's the that's the first treatment. We don't go with immunotherapy. We don't go with chemotherapy. We start with an EGFR targeting drug. So that information is really key because we know that starting with an EGFR drug uh, is much you know, better for that patient. Yep. Now, what happens if you initially send that sample off and instead of having an EGFR mutation, it comes back and they tell you that it's a RAS mutation? So that's a harder question. <laughs> I guess it all depends on which RAS mutation. Um, so, you know, we are developing, we meaning as the scientific community at large, we are developing treatments for RAS mutated lung cancers, but only a very specific subtype will have a targeted therapy. So part of it will be understanding the genetic Results. Sometimes it's very hard to understand the genetic test results. So making Let's sure. Let's say that it's a G, G12, G12D. G12D mutation. So there is a treatment for G12C, but it doesn't work for G12D. So for for patient with G12D, I would start with chemo plus or minus immunotherapy. And how do you decide whether to use immunotherapy for RAS patients? So, um, if they are G12C, I personally will start with chemo because there is some data to show that if you give immunotherapy to close to the targeted therapy for that mutation can increase a, a particular side effect um, in the liver. So, but if it's, you know, a mutation other than G12C, I would be more than um, you know, I would usually start with immunotherapy as well as chemo. And, 
And the reason I'm asking you this question is not because I want our listeners to, to really think about the differences between G12C, G12D, EGFR, but really just to show how the practice of lung cancer has changed dramatically. When I was your age, Chris, mm -hmm. I, I would, you know, we would just use cisplatin and a drug called vinyl relbine, and, and that was how we treated, um, how we treated lung cancer. Um, and we didn't have any, any uh, gene treatments to help drive us. You also realize what makes this such an important, just look at how all the discussion, all the thinking you just did, all the, all the way you balanced all these different issues about the side effects of the patient, the effectiveness of the drugs, all based on the information you got from the tumor sample. And I think that's one of the most important take home messages. I hope people are getting that, that, that Chris would not be able to make the right call now without that information. That precision oncology information is so critical to her in her thinking. And I think you saw a great example of that. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Chris, for, for sharing that with us. Um, we're gonna talk to Colin and then I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Bate come back and join us uh, for, the, um, for the panel discussion just in a second. So thank you so much for your introductory comments. Really appreciate it. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Colin Pritchard. Colin is um, the uh, co-director of the Genetics and Solid Tumor Laboratories at UW Medicine. He's a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology at UW, and he runs our molecular profiling group. Um, his lab is working in several areas to make pre precision oncology a reality for men with prostate cancer, but I would argue that his, his uh, clinical lab um, actually is, is, hitting, uh, is impacting so much more than prostate cancer. And it's the place, for example, where Chris sends those samples that she just talked about uh, from the tumor to be able to, to, uh, to determine this. So, so Chris, where do we, uh, Colin, where do we stand now in genomic profiling of cancers? And, and tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with Oncoplex. Thanks, Tom. It's, it's really an honor to be here and a pleasure to, to be able to talk about, about this work. So I, I always like to joke, Oncoplex was my first baby. <laughs> so we, we've been doing this now for over 10 years, believe it or not, with this uh, genetic sequencing to, to try to tailor therapies for precision oncology and cancer patients. The way uh, we're, we're currently doing it um, is by looking um, at a panel of genes where we know a lot about it. Um, it's a large panel. Um, it's uh, approaching 400 genes, um, but it's not the whole genome. Um, and we look for those targets that you talked about with uh, Dr. Bake, EGFR, RAS, all of those things, and not just for lung cancer, but for all cancer types. Um, the, the, the fun thing about this is that we can now also, in addition to um, these mutations in the DNA, we can look for other biomarkers that are, that are encoded in the DNA, uh, things so, like mutation signatures that might predict immunotherapy response, for example. Terrific. And, and I guess we've already had a question that just came in, and it came in from Herb. And he said, um, why not do total DNA sequencing, the cost of which seems to have dropped from about $1,000? And uh, we've also seen that, that Illumina, the company that makes the sequencing machines that you probably use, not probably, do use uh, to sequence, um, that Illumina now projects that they have a $200 a genome sequence that they can do, whole genome sequence they can do. So. Tell us a little bit different, a little bit about why you do a targeted 400 gene panel versus the $200 uh, uh, Illumina sequence. Yeah, it's a great question, and 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 I'll, I'll I'll start by saying I think the the end game in precision oncology will be whole genome sequencing. That is where we're going. Um, but what I like to say about this topic is a given analogy. So what we have with with our sequencing technologies is like a 747. I mean, it's just, it's a powerful tool. And what we know about the genome is, is like a kid riding a tricycle. And so we have the 747 pulling the kid on the tricycle. It's, it's, it's too much power. Um, so we, we, it's great power for research, but we unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, still know relatively little about the genome and, and how to use that to treat patients. So for that reason, um, at least in 2022, we're really focused in on those genes that we know a lot about, even though the costs are coming down. There are still technical reasons. So even though um, you know, uh, we talk about a $200 genome, that's in an idealized situation. That's not typically, uh, it's not gonna be $200 to do a genome on a, on a patient's tumor. Uh, right now, even with that newer technology, it's gonna be uh, thousands of dollars 
and do it as a quality for patient care. So we, so it's definitely coming down though, and it's really exciting. And and um, you know, we're all as 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 you know, I mean, we're already uh, collaborating closely uh, uh, with Hutch colleagues um, uh, to really make this a reality of whole genome sequencing for patient care, because I, I do think that that is the end game, and I think we'll get there sooner sooner than later. You know, I, I think Colin, what it reminds me of. It reminds me of those um, those plans uh, from the from the uh, cell phone companies where they tell you that you can get a cell phone for thirty dollars a month, and you know I, I've never paid anywhere close to thirty. I've always paid like ten times that for a cell phone, <laughs> and for yeah. some reason when you go and get the cell phone, it ends up being you know several hundred dollars a month. But they claim on the ads it's thirty. Same thing with 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 the gene sequence. They they advertise you can do it for two hundred, but that you know the time it takes to do the interpretation and the make the calls and the software, et cetera, it's just hard to imagine it's gonna be 200 for a while. So I find that quite interesting and I, I think that you've pointed that out uh, very nicely. So I guess the question is, of all the samples that Dr. Bake sends you, and I don't mean just Dr. Bake, but other doctors like Dr. Bake, what percentage can you actually get uh, the um, Oncoplex the to work on? Does it work on all the samples? Well, we, you know, we're really lucky. We have we have a team of uh, pathologists, um, actually led by by Dr. Eric Connick and and Vera Paulson, the, what we call the Genetics Preanalytical Services Team, or GPS. And there's a team of doctors that actually, what I like to say, wrangles tumors and 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 tries to make every single tumor work with the Oncoplex test. And that's that's easier said than done. And so what they do is they actually they review the tumor under the microscope. They actually circle and actually dissect out the areas where there's actually cancer cells, and then that um, improves our chances of success. But that said, not every um, cancer is going to work for Oncoplex, um, and not every not every cancer type is really indicated yet. It, we're getting there. We're almost almost every cancer type. There's there's some indication. Um, but um, the good news is we I would I would say uh, well over. Um, you know, well over half, probably well over 75% of the time, <laughs> we're going to get an adequate specimen, and that's that's thanks to uh, to our talented pathologists. So, I, Colin and I recently had the chance to visit to visit uh, the University of Michigan, and uh, I know there've been a lot of great football games between the University of Michigan and the University of Washington. Well, they also, in addition to having a good football team, they've got a pretty good pathology department. And uh, I was talking to some of the doctors there who felt that looking at RNA seq and looking at what uh, genes are actually expressed might be something that we should be doing as part of precision oncology. What are your thoughts about about looking at RNA seq in this setting? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think RNA seq is the next frontier. Um, you know, we think about omics. Um, uh, you know, we can think about genomics, which is the DNA, transcriptomics, which is the RNA, and even epigenomics, which is uh, another thing we haven't talked about yet. But, but as far as RNA, yes, it, there's, it's really a powerful tool. We can do a number of things with it. We can look for um, certain kinds of uh, what we call gene fusions um, are, are better measured by RNA technology. And we, we do already offer that in a targeted way uh, even now. Um, but importantly, we can also look at the, the levels of the gene, the so-called gene expression by RNA, and do all kinds of new biomarkers. So I think it is the future. There are some technical challenges. Um, RNA is um, a molecule that's more easily degraded um, in the lab, and so there are some, some, some technical issues around getting RNA up, up and going. Um, but it is the future. It is already happening now, at least for these targeted gene fusions, and I think um, I think it will be there for whole genome RNA seq very soon in the in, in the clinical practice space. Great, thank you, Colin. And um, I, I know you're going to stay around for the panel discussion that we're going to have in just a second. Thank you so much for everything you're doing right. to advance our precision oncology program. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Jeff Leak, and Dr. Jeff Leak is brand new um, to the Fred Hutch, and um, uh, Jeff is our vice president and chief data officer at the Hutch. He's a professor in the biostatistics program in the public health sciences division at the Hutch, and he holds the J. Orrin Edson Foundation endowed chair at the Fred Hutch. We are so happy uh, that Jeff has joined us from Johns Hopkins. It is terrific to have him here, and Jeff, welcome aboard. So the one thing that we haven't talked about yet um, is one of the secrets that we don't always advertise to people. It's just how hard it is to store all the data uh, that's generated in whole genome sequencing. Give us a little sense about the magnitude of data um, that we're looking at when uh, when Colin does 
a 400 gene panel versus when he does a, a whole genome sequence, how much data is that? And put that in terms that we can sort of compare to how much data we put on a computer or a cell phone. Thank you very much for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, good to talk to you. Yeah, that's an incredibly good question. I think one of the, uh, referring to Herb's great question a minute ago that, that Colin answered around whole genome sequencing, one of the challenges we have when you're talking about that 747 driving a tricycle is really the magnitude, quantity, and complication of the type of data that we store. And so we collect a variety of different data types, whether it's sequencing data from genomes, whether it's sequencing data from RNA. Um, and all of these data come in in a really complicated way. They come in as a, uh, you can think of it as the world's hardest jigsaw puzzle, right? You come in with these very short sequences of DNA or RNA that we measure, hundreds of millions of them, billions of them. And then we have to compile those back into measurements of what variants exist in those genes or what gene expression levels there are. That's a really challenging computer science and statistics problem that we have an incredible collection of people here at the Hutch who are spending time thinking about how do we take these complicated raw measurements that we get off of a sequencing machine and turn them into uh, a piece of information that can actually be used by Dr. Bake or Dr. Pritchard or Dr. Lynch when they're in the clinic trying to help a patient. You can think of it as if you opened up an Excel file with 100 million lines in it or 100 billion lines in it, and then you tried to take each of those lines and piece them back in together into a piece of information. Imagine each line is a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. It's really a complicated data problem. And so it's exciting to be a part of the data team that tries to turn those messy, ugly data into information that can actually be used to help patients. So Jeff, a, a typical whole genome of a human, of a human cancer, how many bytes of data is that? Sure, yeah, so you can think of it as, um, it, it depends on what you call the data, right? If you talk those little, like that early data that we just collect fresh off the machine, it might be a hunt, it might be 50 terabytes of data for a single patient, depending on how big the, the sequencing run was. And so that could be, you know, you can think of this, I know you said in terms of a movie or something like that. Yeah. You can think of it as like multiple movies of data for a single patient that we're getting. And then we have to, but most of that information actually isn't relevant for cancer care. Um, as Colin just uh, pointed out, Dr. Pritchard pointed out, some of those pieces of the genome are incredibly important. The right mutation, knowing if you have a, a patient has a particular mut mutation is incredibly important. And then there's a whole host of genes that have no impact or very little impact directly on that patient's cancer care. So it's not just getting the right information, it's also filtering out information that you don't need to make uh, critical clinical decisions. And so both filtering out the information you don't need and making sure the right information is there is a real challenge for the computational and data team that are that are working with the clinicians and, and biologists on this problem. And and I guess one of the things we're going to hear about in a second um, from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jana uh, in a bit who's doing research in this area is um, how do you have to work to, to, to set up uh, data systems so that our researchers can begin to ask important questions. I mean, one of the great things um, when I think back to, I was lucky to be involved in the EGFR mutation story um, and the discovery of EGFR mutations. And, and we did that really without any AI enabled anything. Um, it was done just by making an observation in a patient and kind of getting lucky uh, on finding these mutations. And what was interesting is people had already found mutations in the EGFR gene in other circumstances, but they never knew what it meant. And it had been there for years and kind of lying out there in, in uh, you know, open available, open data sets, but no one ever really was able to put it all together. So tell, tell me a little bit about the ability to, to look at data and, and, and learn from it and, and some of the struggles that we have trying to know what's junk and what turns out to be absolutely critical. That's a great question. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I was so excited about joining the Hutch is this recent merger of the hospital with the research arm at the Hutch is an incredibly powerful opportunity. Because what we want to do is collect information from patients as Dr. Bake does when they get a patient in, they send them out to Dr. Pritchard to get their tumor sequence. And we collect that information. And we have some idea about which mutations will impact the patient's care right now. But there's a lot that we still don't know. And so for the, the powerful thing about bringing a clinic and a research enterprise together is that as a, as a tying factor between those two organizations is the data. We collect that data, amass it across different patients, respectfully managing the security issues, the privacy issues, the ethical issues, and using that data to do research. We can make new discoveries at the research level, which can then be implemented in the clinic and tested in the clinic to make sure that they make sense. And that virtuous cycle of collecting information from patients 
studying that information to make new discoveries, and then re-implementing that in a clinic can only be done in an operation where you have a clinical arm that's working in close concert with the research arm. And the data piece is the underlying infrastructure that lets you pass that information back and forth from one side to the other. The challenge is really, how do we protect patient information and also facilitate research? So we have to set up both technological and people infrastructure that allows us to pass that data back and forth securely and in respecting all of the required regulations and making sure that we keep track of who's doing what with the data so that we can make sure we both respect patient privacy and they can trust us with their data, that we can also make these new discoveries which will allow us to speed patient care. Fantastic. And so the last question I want to ask you, Jeff, is, Jeff, you're new to Seattle, um, and, um, you know, we're known as a, as, as a tech center with lots of leading-edge uh, data science companies. How are you looking to develop external partnerships for the Hutch as our chief data officer? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And one of the, another incredibly exciting reason to be here at the Hutch is that we have these amazing technology partners here in the city of Seattle. The, the large scale partners, obviously Amazon and Microsoft and Google are uh, fantastic partners for building large scale infrastructure and also thinking creatively about problems. There's also a really engaged and exciting technology um, startup community here in the city of Seattle that's focused at the intersection of using data and biology. And so I think that it helps us in a number of ways. It helps us with big infrastructure projects. We can collaborate with and think with our partners about how to do that at the large scale. It also allows us to think about how do we move things from discoveries here that are made at the Hutch into eventually, as you mentioned, Tom, products that are um, moved out into industry and are scaled out so that we can have this impact nationally and as well as the people that we see here at the Hutch. And so I think there's both the connections to scale things out and the connections to help us build large pieces of infrastructure that we really can do in a really engaged way with our technology partners here. Terrific. So Jeff, thank you very much. We're going to have you back in just a few minutes uh, to join the panel. Really appreciate uh, your input. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Sujata Jana. Uh, Sujata focuses on bladder cancer, is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Dr. Andrew Shea, um, who's a physician scientist at Fred Hutch and UW Medicine. And, and Andrew treats patients with prostate and bladder. Sujata is a PhD um, who does science and does research um, in this area. She's also a strong advocate for women in STEM and does outreach to promote interest in science. And Sujata, it's terrific to have you with us today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. It's really great. So we've talked about with uh, Dr. Bake about sampling and Dr. Pritchard about sequencing and Dr. Leake about storing data as it relates to precision oncology. Now let's talk about how you're able to use this information. Um, and, and you and Dr. Shea have made some significant progress with precision oncology and bladder cancer. Tell us a little bit more about what you're doing. Uh, thank you, Tom, for having me. Um, I would say whenever we think about the next best uh, therapeutic targets, we have to always know the disease ins and out and the kind of work that we are doing in Shea Lab. We are trying to understand how cellular transformation works and uh, how disease progression. So what I mean by that, how, can, how normal cells can be transformed to cancer and what are the key factors that can actually uh, uh, make tumors more aggressive. So we have multiple bladder cancer projects in the lab where the key findings suggest that protein synthesis is one of the key factors that could be important for bladder cancer uh, maintenance and especially the factor like translation factor like phospho-EIF4E is highly expressed in 37% of the bladder cancer uh, patients where if we target those uh, uh, that protein using drug that could be a terrific uh, future targeted therapy for people who are expressing high level of phospho-EIF4E. There is another study we have conducted in lab where the genomic sequencing of tumors uh, bladder tumors shows that um, there are 70% of the mutational signatures are preserved between uh, primary and the uh, uh, metastatic tumors within individual. And this is a terrific information because with that, what we can do, we can um, uh, biopsy for a specific metastatic tumor and then devise a treatment plan for the particular individual. Terrific. Now, so Sujata, you know, when I think about bladder cancer, I think of two types of bladder cancer. I think of you've got a lot of patients who have superficial bladder cancer, and they 
uh, maybe have a little bit of blood in their urine, they see their, um, their urologist, and the urologist finds a little bladder cancer, goes in and, and shaves it off, and maybe they give some immune therapy into the bladder, but it's not really a life-threatening thing. And then you've got people who've got life-threatening bladder cancer, where the bladder cancer can spread to lymph nodes and can spread to other parts of the body, like the bone or the lung or the liver. Um, do we know, are there genetic differences uh, between the bladder cancers that just sit on the surface of the bladder and those that become invasive and cause more trouble? Yes, we do have a significant difference between those kind of uh, two diseases where we took the, uh, uh, mentioned there as non-invasive bladder cancer or muscle-invasive bladder cancer. Uh, yeah, we do see uh, uh, specific uh, uh, genetic signature, mutation signature between those. But um, what I was talking back then, uh, interesting thing is we know het how tumor heterogeneity can be a big problem for treatment. Uh, for the patient because uh, it makes a uh, treatment plan very difficult. So um, knowing the, the heterogeneity of the tumors and the primary and the metastatic might help a lot for physician to devise a treatment plan for the patient. Terrific. And I guess the, the last couple of questions I have for you, Sujata. First, what inspires you to do this work? Why did you choose to do this? You could have been a PhD studying almost anything in science and you chose to do this. What made you do that? So uh, it uh, the inspiration comes from a personal tragedy of mine. Um, uh, pardon me if I become a little bit uh, emotional about it while sharing this uh, story. So I was set out to become a plant uh, research scientist. My uncle was a successful plant geneticist and I wanted to follow his footsteps. So I enrolled for an um, undergraduate program in plant science. And then into one year to my program, he was diagnosed with cancer and died within six months. And it left us uh, very perplexed and we felt very helpless as a family that we couldn't help him. And the day he died, I stood there and I promised to myself that I will change my career path um, from plant science to human biology and I'll try to contribute as much as possible in the cancer research field. So I completed my undergrad, I uh, completed my um, master's in uh, microbiology. I came to this country to uh, do my PhD in biochemistry. And then I wanted to do my postdoctoral research in Cancer Institute and you wouldn't believe I could possibly find any cancer research institute in this country and I applied for postdoctoral position. And most of the places I denied because I didn't have extensive cancer research background. And I was very really sad about it. I was thinking like, well, somebody has to give me this opportunity. And then I met my current mentor, Dr. Andrew Shea. And I remember during our uh, conversation, uh, during the interview, he said something and it stayed with me that uh, if you want to do cool science and want to make a difference, there is no better place than Fred Hatch. And I agree with him. The last five years, we have completed so many exciting projects on bladder cancer got research funding, and we have published many papers. But I wouldn't say the selling was smooth because as an immigrant to this country, we don't, we are not allowed to apply for a lot of research grant. So I had to actually depend on uh, donor advised funds in the lab to do my preliminary research. And then we could secure the uh, very big funding for my research from Department of Defense. So I would say like any kind of donation people make towards science is a small or big, doesn't matter. It makes a huge difference towards the field and it actually helps moving forward the research. And, and then the last question I wanna ask you before we bring the panel in, is you've done a lot of work in thinking about women in STEM. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, so yeah, um, sometimes people, especially girls, they are kind of trained in a way that uh, research could be a long career path to settle in and then um, girls are, uh, they, sometimes they can be lost in the very early phase when they have to decide whether they want to be a scientist or a doctor or engineer. I think like the more people like us, like women, we can promote them or we can actually reach out to them, talk about science, how it is very cool to do all kinds of science and get involved in the mainstream research projects. We can motivate them and we can channelize that, that energy to uh, building new scientists, future scientists in our society. So I'm, it, it's very close to my heart, and I, I absolutely love to encourage them to become scientists in future. 
Terrific. Uh, Sujata, thank you so much. I want to bring the panel back. Um, we're getting a lot of great questions. I would like to ask everyone who's uh, participating, please put your questions in the Q&A. We'll try to get to as many of the questions as we can. We have a fantastic panel. This really is a great opportunity to ask, uh, ask questions. So I'm going to start the first question for Dr. Bake. And the first question for Dr. Bake is, um, can you tell us the difference between precision oncology and immunotherapy? What's the difference between those two things? And you're perfect to answer that because your career spans both areas. That's right. So I think when we think of precision oncology, we really, you know, we really focus on the genetic uh, aspect of it because that's where the advances have been. And immunotherapy right now, the way we choose immunotherapy for patients is a bit crude. Um, so, but I think we can certainly, you could definitely use the tools that we have in precision oncology, understanding the tumor, why immunotherapy works for this one patient, but not the other. Maybe this, you know, patient one uh, needs two immunotherapy and the second one just needs one. And some of these, uh, you know, nuances, we are just very, you know, in the very beginning of understanding. So I think, you know, my vision for our, our center is that, that we're not, you know, we're looking at precision oncology from all, you know, different disciplines, including immunotherapy. Terrific. And Colin, a question for you is, um, uh, can you comment on the differences between uh, what you're able to do at University of Washington versus some of the commercial companies that are offering sequencing? Is it the same? Is it different? Is there a reason patients should want to do one or the other? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, there there are um, a lot of commercial options right now. Um, I think you you hit it uh, on the on the head, uh, Tom, when you said about the interpretation piece, and I think that's really a key aspect. Um, these are not um, simple lab tests. These are much more akin to doing the most complex radiology study you can imagine, like a PET CT or something like that. And we all understand that there's a doctor who goes through lots of training called a radiologist who then reads your scan and their input is, is absolutely critical in making that medical diagnosis when you get those fancy scans. This is exactly the same. If anything, it's even more complicated because we know so little about the genome. So we're really, we really, um, and then and then like uh, Jeff, uh, Dr. Leek was talking about too, I mean, the, the, the big data and finding those needles in the haystack with so much data is a challenge too. So I think long-winded way of saying, I think it's really the interpretive aspect that's key. But in addition to that, I think um, this distributed model where major centers like FHCC and, and, and other major academic centers um, set up their own in-house sequencing, I think is going to be the future of genomic medicine, um, not just because of the interpretive aspect, but also so that we can keep up with the research. Uh, companies can be sometimes constrained while they make good tests, they can be sometimes constrained in, in, in sort of the pace of innovation, where that's one thing we can do well in the, in the academic space. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Jeff, this question's for you. It's from Sonali uh, Tamaker. And uh, Sonali asks, multimodal, multi multimodal integration of advanced molecular diagnostics, radiologic and histologic imaging, and codified clinical data may represent opportunities to advance precision oncology beyond genomics and standard molecular techniques. How can we leverage multimodal data at the Fred Hutch? That's a great question, and thanks, Tom, for asking it. I would say that um, just speaking to uh, Dr. Pritchard's point a minute ago, even if you're just thinking about one type of data, say whole genome sequencing data, it's already a very complicated data science problem from a couple of perspectives. Just the engineering of moving that much data to the right place and filtering it down into the relevant information is already a hard problem. Then if you need to link it to other different data types, you've multiplied that engineering problem across uh, different uh, aspects and modalities. The interesting thing is that this is something that clinicians do all the time anyway. You pay attention to the radiology, you pay attention to the genetic information, and you coordinate that internally as a person all the time as you're a trained physician. How do we teach machines to be able to make those interpretations? First, we have to understand at a fundamental level what all of these things mean, as Dr. Pritchard pointed out. We have to understand what all those needles in the haystack mean. Then we have to teach algorithms what we already, what physicians already know, and the next to make new discoveries. These are all complicated engineering problems. 
which are really exciting to work on, but we're at the very beginning of us making these discoveries and developing these technologies. And so it's um, both exciting, but also it makes it very challenging to integrate these multiple data types together. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. So Dr. Uh, John, a question for you, which is as a scientist, um, uh, do you think of yourself as a data scientist? Um, so we, as a scientist, we are all data scientists, but I, I, I am not. Uh, <laughs> I am not, but I appreciate the uh, the monumental data that we collect from any kind of uh, sequencing, and it it is a, a treasure trove of information. And when, as a researcher, we start to analyze these data, I have seen my colleagues like they are they are trying to extract as much as information from this kind of data but at the end of the day we we have to think like what kind of information on one liner or the bottom line we can get and transfer to the clinic so that it actually helps people to make decision while they are doing uh, they, they are planning for the treatment plan for a particular individual i think that makes a huge difference as a researcher we always love to have data lot of data um, analyze it find it all kind of graphs and um, bar graphs but i think at the end of the day that makes sense what we get out of it and how we can use it in the clinic so there's I, i'm gonna ask a question for for dr pritchard dr jana and dr leek uh, which is that you know we've gotten these two big gifts to the fred hutch we're going to build a new building and we talk a lot about the difference between dry labs and wet labs now this building we're building is going to be the newest building at the Hutch for the next 40 years. It's going to be a really, or maybe the next 30 years, to be a really important place. Is it smart to separate dry lab from wet lab? How should we have dry lab and wet lab working together? And is that kind of an artificial distinction that might break down over the next couple of years? And maybe we shouldn't be thinking about separating these two. Uh, Jeff, Colin, uh, Sujata, what do you think? Do you want to go ahead? I, I mean, I'm happy to jump in, but then I would love to hear the answers from both of you too. I think that I loved your answer, Sujata. I love Dr. Chandler, your answer, which was we're all data scientists now. I, I feel that way deeply that no matter what you do, it's not even just cancer care, it's everything. Data affects our lives in all sorts of ways and we're all gonna be data scientists going forward. One of the things we hope to do here at the Hutch is spread data science training and support and, and basically help everybody that data themselves. We don't think it should be just a few experts. And so I love your point, Tom, that we want to make sure we're integrating data scientists and dry lab scientists and wet lab scientists. But then I think in the future, it, there's a, definitely a version of the future where we're all data scientists. We all have to learn enough of this to be able to interpret the massive quantities of data that are coming down. I'd love to hear the other answer. Uh, I think uh, there should be no demarcation about data uh, dry lab versus wet lab because to dev to extract all this information useful information I think we need to interact all the time because it's it's very important for a dry lab to get the aspect that what we are doing in the wet lab and we need to also communicate with them to actually understand the the mechanism behind it to go. Like whenever we are thinking about any problem, we need that aspect of the data knowledge to actually do wet lab research. So I think it would be really great to have both the uh, both the labs together and interacting on daily basis regarding their research. Terrific. And Colin? Yeah, I agree with everything that Drs. Leek and, and Jana said. I, I think having co-location of dry lab and wet lab is 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 a great idea. And, and I can say from the clinical lab perspective. That's certainly the model that that we've tried to take. Where you know be, before this new technology of, of tumor sequencing, um, there wasn't a lot of dry lab aspect to the clinical lab. But since then, um, there uh, it's it's integral. So we have what we call the NGS Analytics Laboratory, which is kind of embedded within our larger group, uh, and then we physically co-locate um, th those clinical dry lab folks with the clinical wet lab folks. So I think it, it's true also on the clinical side as well as the research side. Terrific. Well, Dr. Bake, we've got some clinical questions for you. Um, I'm curious how you'll answer this one because it's already been answered by the Fred Hutch team. And, and I might actually differ from the Fred Hutch team, but let me see what you think. And this comes from Dixie Strunk. And the question is, a biopsy, uh, is this true? A biopsy could spread the cancer with a poke? So the short, uh, 
Answer is no, uh, not all the time. There are very specific tumors where we have to be very cautious about how we biopsy to protect or preserve the capsule of the tumor. So there are very specific tumors, but for uh, except for those specific tumors, I'm you know I'm thinking thymoma, for example, very rare tumor. Um, so except for these specific ones, biopsies will not, they will not uh, spread the cancer or cause metastases. Uh, and it is a question that I get asked as well. Yeah, I get asked that, I used to get asked that question all the time. And the actual biopsy doesn't, I'd say the one circumstance that I used to see it a lot were mesothelioma, where you can get, um, uh, you can get tumors spread along the biopsy or chest tube path. And mesotheliomas are a pretty darn rare form of cancer that happens in the chest wall or in the abdomen, in the wall of the abdomen, or, or really the wall of any uh, type of serosal uh, type surface. And um, they're rare cancers, but they do they can grow out those tracks. And so one of the things that surgeons usually do is they'll excise the chest tube site uh, because you can get local recurrence of mesothelioma in that setting. Uh, but for the standard whether it's breast cancer or whether it's uh, lung cancer, I, I agree entirely with uh, with Dr. Bake that it doesn't it doesn't do that. I think that that's an important uh, important distinction to 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 be able to make. Um, and so uh, the next question also will be uh, for Dr. Bake, um, and this is from Diane. That's a great question. They're all great questions, but this one's a, particularly resonates with me. So you talk about liquid biopsies, okay? And you talk about how when one of your patients let's say with an EGFR mutation progresses, or even a new patient, you might send a liquid biopsy, which is just a blood test um, uh, for sequencing. Um, well, what about this? What if you had a relative who was a heavy smoker or a relative who might have carry the BRCA gene or a relative who might carry a gene that predisposes to colorectal cancer risk? What about looking at, at plasma DNA changes for, um, for early signs of, of cancer in the blood. Do we have any evidence, Dr. Bake, that um, that these early detection tests might make a difference? And I know we've got, I should uh, disclose that the Hutch is an investor because uh, part of our technology was used to found the company Grail. So there is a Hutch conflict of interest, but there's not a Dr. Bake conflict of interest. So she can tell oh. us, she can tell us what she thinks. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's good to remember uh, that there are different liquid biopsies. So there are different types. Um, so the ones that we use to detect genetic abnormalities in patients with cancer are different from the ones that that we that are being developed to to understand the risk of a patient or early detection. So I think that's that that's the one distinguishing factor that I wanted to point out. If, you know, and there are um, sort of technical issues why a liquid biopsy may not work even in a patient with known cancer based on the amount of sort of the DNA that you know, circulates in the body. Um, so, I mean, it's a powerful tool. I think in the clinic, we are using it very regularly. I think for patients or for folks who are not of cancer patients, you know, don't have a diagnosis, but there's a high risk, there's certainly a lot of work going on on the early detection side, and, and certainly at the Hutch, I have colleagues who are looking to develop uh, these early detection markers along with CT scans. Because when we get CT scans, we can see all kinds of random things as well. You know, some patients may say, "What if we just do scan of head to toe every couple of years?" You know, for example. But that in itself is not going to tell us information. So. But the point is that we have, you know, bright scientists, not just here, but, you know, across the world who are who's looking at that specific question. So, Chris, thank you. And I think this will probably be our last question that we'll get to. I'm going to start it with Dr. Pritchard, but uh, Dr. Jana and Dr. Leek and Dr. Bake would be very uh, welcome to opine on it. And it comes from Ray Manat, who's one of our great scientists. And it points out that tumors are, are really small villages of cancer cells surrounded by connective tissue, vessels, inflammatory cells, immune cells. Does it matter to sequence those? Um, how do we, you know, why do we think that all the information really matters is from the tumor? What about from the, 
from the microbiome or, or from the inflammatory cells or the or the immune cells that are present? How do you look at the at the fact that that a tumor isn't just cancer cells, Colin? Yeah, it's a great question uh, from from uh, Ray, our, our close colleague. Uh, and it, it's true. I mean, the two, what we call the tumor microenvironment um, is all those cells you refer to beyond just the cancer cells, and they absolutely matter. Um, there already is are, are some early tests that look for alterations in, say, immune cells that are next to the cancer cells and may be predictive of immunotherapy. So that's already happening to some extent, but we have a long way to go there. I mean, that's another complexity. We talked about the different omics. You know, there's uh, there's all the different omics you can do just on the cancer cells, and then there's the complexity of all the different cells. Uh, cancer is it's it's almost like a living organism. It's not just the cancer cells. So we have a long way to go, but but we are already using some of that information, particularly for immunotherapy. Dr. Jana, Dr. Leek. When as a researcher we think about cancer cells, we we often think that's very straightforward, but that's not the case. It uh, it is a very dynamic factory. Everything is happening there with the microenvironment, with the microbiome and the uh, immune cells it, it's a it's a collective system so so to do more research we have to have those aspects to understand the tumor biology i think these are great questions and jeff any thoughts yeah i think that i agree that those are really interesting environments to dis, to study as well i i think it just makes me even more excited for more data that i can collect every time somebody talks about a new uh thing to look at i'm like more data for me i'm excited perfect. about it so yeah more, more for us to do which which i think is great perfect i'm going to squeeze one last question and i'm going to answer it which is is there a role for prison oncology within metastatic colon cancer and i would say the answer is absolutely yes so first there is a, a clear role for somatic sequencing, meaning can sequencing of the cancer itself um, at the time of presentation with advanced disease. You want to know whether or not it's, mut it's, it's uh, mutated in RAS or RAF, because the way you treat the cancer would be very different based on those mutations that are present. You also want to know if there are abnormalities in DNA repair enzymes, uh, which are important in, in potential response to immunotherapy or other areas like that. So absolute role from precision oncology in metastatic colorectal cancer. I would also argue that you also uh, want to be screening people with colorectal cancer for hereditary cancer genes that could predict which, which uh, uh, whether or not there's a cancer syndrome at play that could influence cancer risk for a patient's kids or their siblings or, their, or other members of their family. So um, Hillary adds the question about uh, precision oncology and metastatic colorectal cancer. There absolutely is, and if we didn't have Dr. Bake here today, we would have a colon cancer expert as well, but, but Dr. Bake happens to be a lung cancer expert, so that's why we focused on that, but we could have focused on colon just as easily. I want to thank the panel for a terrific discussion. We're now at the hour. Um, again, it's been a remarkable day for the Fred Hodge, and it's a remarkable day because of all the people on this call who've been extremely generous to us over the years. Um, people like you fuel our research and make our scientific breakthroughs possible. Thank you so much. I have such gratitude for all of the support we get from the community and all the support we get by people whose lives we've touched. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye.